I want to speak to you this morning about the purpose for which Jesus Christ died. What is it that makes Good Friday good? <clears throat> Last Sunday morning, um, if you were here, we saw how Jesus set his face to, to go to Jerusalem. He, he set his face resolutely to go to Jerusalem, knowing already at that point where it was to lead. It was to lead to his suffering and death there, as that happened, as we've heard in the readings from Luke's Gospel that we've heard. So it was for a purpose that Jesus went to Jerusalem. It was no accident, but entirely deliberate and purposeful. What was that purpose? Well, Luke's Gospel gives us hints in answer to that. Hints that other parts of the Bible explain more fully and more plainly uh, we, there's a hint at the Last Supper, which we looked at last Sunday evening, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, and he said that of a Passover. And there's a clearly a hint there implying that Jesus was about to achieve an even greater redemption than the Passover was set up to commemorate, freeing people from a bondage greater than Pharaoh inflicted on the Israelites in Egypt. Luke give, gives other hints too. In chapter 9, verse 31, Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus at Jesus' transfiguration. And they speak with Jesus about Jesus' quote, departure. They're speaking about his death, but they call it his departure. And the word they actually use in Greek is the word exodus. They speak about Jesus' exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Another hint then that the death of Jesus would free people. So what does Jesus' death free people what and how? Well, the answer is found in a word that came up in the Bible readings that we had, in fact, right at the start of the first Bible reading, very close to the start of the first Bible reading. Luke chapter 22, verse 42. The word I want to focus on this morning is the word cup. Chapter 22, verse 42. <clears throat> Jesus here is, is in Gethsemane, and he prays this. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. So why does Jesus use this word cup about his imminent suffering? He could have used all sorts of phrases, but he uses this word cup. Why is that? And the answer is because it has connotations from the Old Testament. <clears throat> and these connotations tell us what purpose he was dying for and how it achieves that purpose. Let me then read some Old Testament passages that give some background about this word cup that Jesus uses here in Gethsemane. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 17 and 22. The Lord says this, Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who've drunk, from the, who've drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. Thus says your Lord, the Lord, your God, who pleads the cause of his people, Behold, I've taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath. You shall drink no more. And then Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 15. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, sorry, thus the Lord, the God of Israel said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. And if they refuse to accept the cup from your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, you must drink. For behold, I begin to work disaster at the city that is called by my name, that's Jerusalem. And shall you go unpunished, that's the Gentiles? You shall not go unpunished, for I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth, declares the Lord of hosts. And then Psalm 75, verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. So what's that cup about then? Hopefully you've seen as we've looked at those three little passages from the Old Testament. It's the cup of God's wrath. It's the cup of God's punishment on the wicked. And you see how in all those passages... God's wrath is depicted as this foaming cup of wine that's maddening to drink. It's hideous. It's a hideous cup. It's, it's an unbearable thing that the wicked of the earth must drink, says Jeremiah, says the Lord to Jeremiah. So when, this, so when God hands this cup 
to someone, they must drink it. We saw that in the Jeremiah reading. And when the Lord takes it away from someone, this cup, it is wonderfully removed. We saw that in the Isaiah reading. So do you begin to see how this background uh, it sheds light on Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane before the cross? And in fact, it shows us what Jesus is in anguish about in Gethsemane, doesn't it? What Jesus is in absolute horror of as he's sweating drops of blood, thinking about this cup that the, that the Father is handing to him. It wasn't the crucifixion that made him sweat drops of blood. It wasn't the scourging he was about to face, which was hideous, which would be, leave his back in tatters. It wasn't the crown of thorns. It wasn't the abject abuse he'd received from the, the Roman guards and from the Jewish authorities. Any one of those would be utterly horrific. It was the cup of God's wrath held out for Jesus to drink, which it was the Father's will for him to drink. And Jesus recoils in horror from that and that alone. And he does so because being himself fully God, he knows better than any of us the greatness of God's anger at sin because he feels it himself. He is going to judge the nations one day. He knows the greatness, the magnitude, the infinitude of God's wrath at sin better than any of us do. He knows it's infinitely worse than physical pain. The cup of God's wrath is what we each deserve because of our sin. We have corrupt hearts. You and I have corrupt hearts, stained with Adam's sin, stained with our own sin. Our best deeds are impure in God's sight. They're filthy in God's sight because they come from an evil heart. A heart of pride, lust, malice. Do you see yourself in these words? I see myself. Self-will, refusing to acknowledge God for who he is. We've not honoured the eternal God of heaven as our rightful Lord, whose good gifts we enjoy every moment. He is pure good and we have not loved him with all our heart and soul. He is holy and we've profaned his name. He is our creator, but we've not honoured him. He's Lord of all, but we've rebelled against his rule. We've lived as though we are God. We've usurped him. And for this, we each deserve the unbearable, unendurable cup of God's wrath. And that is the entirety of what you and I deserve from God. But Jesus didn't deserve it. Not one bit. He's the perfect, unblemished son of God. He had done no deceit, no violence, no sin of any kind, no impurity. No evil thoughts, not even one. He alone lived a life that's well-pleasing in God's sight without one sin. He's, the, he's God's beloved Son, now resurrected and honoured and exalted at the Father's right hand. So how come God the Father hands Jesus this unbearable, unendurable cup of his wrath to drink right down to its bitter dregs? The glorious answer is it was to save people from that very same thing. People who deserve it, people like you and me. By the grace of God, Jesus was given this bitter cup to drink, to free from its miseries all who come to him in true repentance and faith. You and I, we deserve hell, we deserve the wrath of God. But see the tender mercy of the cross as Jesus Jesus bears it for us. So here's the good news of Good Friday. The Lord Jesus on the cross has faced the wrath of God, the worst that we, that we, that we deserve. He's faced it. He's faced the just judicial punishment that sinners deserve so that those who repent and humbly come to Christ for mercy will receive it, will receive abundant mercy, abundant pardon for their sins. Forgiveness, total free forgiveness. So for those who renounce all trust in themselves and trust solely in Jesus Christ, this Son of God sent for us, sent to the cross for us, for those who trust in him alone, God's justice is satisfied. And his unstoppable, invincible wrath has now turned to such unstoppable, invincible favour that God has covenanted to be their God and Father forever. And nothing can snatch them out of his hand and nothing can separate them from his love. 
God's insurmountable wrath has changed to insurmountable favor and grace and love and mercy. Unbreakable for those who are Christ's. So I want to do two things as I draw to a close. I want to urge and encourage. I want to urge this good news on those who have not yet seized hold of Christ. And I want to encourage those who have to enjoy and to stand firm in this grace. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus Christ personally precious to you? Do you love him for what he's done for you? Turning your hell to heaven. Turning the wrath of God towards you into peace and reconciliation with God. If not, then I urge you to consider the cross and what we've thought about this morning. The wrath of God that Jesus Jesus receives there. Manifestly for sins not his own. And as you consider the cross, plead with God to show you your sin. Your desperate need of Christ. So if there's any here this morning who for whom Jesus Christ is not personally precious as your saviour for your sin that you feel and know, then don't just go home and let this get forgotten. Don't let any natural aversion to the idea of hell, we don't like hell, do we? We don't like talking about God's wrath, we don't like thinking about it, but don't let any natural aversion to that dissuade you. Don't let any supposing yourself to be a Christian already satisfy you that all is well. If Christ is not precious to you for your salvation personally, then look to Christ. I urge you to look to Christ crucified and see how there is no adequate way to explain it other than it being God's merciful provision for sinners to flee from hell. And then flee to Christ yourself. Put all your trust in him personally. Confess that you are all sin and that he is all that you need. And begin a new life of repentance and faith in him. And finally, as I speak to those who love Jesus and what he's done for you, let today be a day of holy joy for you. Holy joy. As you consider your saviour and his sufferings, let this not be to depress your spirits but to enliven them by this consideration. It was for you. It was for you that he hung and suffered there. There are various church traditions which make much of the sufferings of Jesus. But many that have no sense of a a faith that sees a personal interest in the Saviour's blood, as Charles Wesley put it in his hymn. We're not merely then to perform acts of homage and grieving for Christ. I was speaking to one such person yesterday as we were out tracting. One person who was deeply into all sorts of veneration and remembering the sufferings of Jesus, but not with a personal faith in him. Jesus says, Jesus says in Luke 23 verse 38, do not weep for me. Don't weep for me, he says. So what are we to do then? Well, here's an answer that the Puritan Thomas Goodwin gives. Faith is principally and mainly to look unto the end, meaning, and intent of God and Christ in his sufferings, and not simply at the tragic story of his death and sufferings. It is the heart and mind and intent of Christ in suffering which faith chiefly eyes, views, latches hold of, and which draws the height, uh, sorry, draws the heart on to rest on Christ crucified. When a believer sees that Christ's aim in suffering for poor sinners agrees and answers to the aim and desires of his heart and that that was the end of it, that sinners might have forgiveness and that Christ's heart was as full in it to procure it as the sinner's heart can be to desire it, this draws his heart into Christ to rest upon him. And without this, the contemplation and meditation of the story of his sufferings and of the greatness of them will be altogether unprofitable. So then, that's the end of Goodwin's quote. As we consider the events of Good Friday today, let this fill our thoughts. If you're a believer, if you love Jesus, 
and you fled to him. Let this fill your thoughts. It was for your sake. It was for my sake that he drank the cup of God's wrath. It was for your sake, my sake, that the Father did not remove that cup, though Jesus asked him to. It was for your sake and my sake that Jesus said, yet not my will, but yours be done, as he received that cup. It was for our peace and reconciliation with God that Jesus was condemned by God. His taking of that bitter cup was for our healing. Our guilty stains were imputed to Christ, counted as his, so that all his God-pleasing righteousness would be imputed to us, counted as ours. So Jesus has fully paid the price of all our sins. There's no more to pay. There was hell to pay. It has been paid in full. God's wrath towards you has been propitiated, fully spent on Christ. It is over. It is done. And that's a free gift of yours that you receive and I receive through empty-handed faith. So let this draw our hearts to Christ in love and devotion. It's a bit like Palm Sunday. Don't let this be a forbidding day to you as you see the sufferings of Christ. Let this be an inviting day for you, drawing you near to your Saviour who died for you. So come in true love and devotion and thankfulness. Let the ending of God's wrath against you, which was real, and against me it was real, it was deserved, it was terrible, unendurable, but is no more. Let this cause our hearts to be drawn to our God even when we've sinned. Maybe some of you here this morning have gone cold. Maybe you are in the process of going cold. Maybe you're in the process of going astray. But let the good news of Good Friday Draw your heart back to God to receive a cleansed conscience and a renewed impetus to live for Christ by the power and mercy of the blood that he shed at the cross. Let's pray.